Namaskar and a very good afternoon. Respected distinguished officials, Shri K. Jayakumarji, President Dillnet and Chair of today's program. The invited speaker, Dr. Heather Brown, Dr. S.S. Murthy, Vice President Dillnet, Dr. P.R. Goswami, Treasurer, the Dillnet Governing Board members, Mr. Owen Safapuri from Dillnet Coordination Unit, Bangalore, Dr. Neela J. Deshpande from Dillnet Coordination Unit, Pune, heads of institutions, renowned library and information science professionals, library professionals from Delnet member institutions and other institutions, well-known writers and poets, members and officials of India International Center, New Delhi, Delnet staff members at New Delhi, Bangalore, Hyderabad and Pune offices, ladies and gentlemen. I, Sangeeta Kaul, on behalf of Delnet, would like to welcome you and express our very warm, sincere gratitude to each one of you for joining us online today from various parts of India and outside for the first Dr. H.K. Call Memorial Lecture on Interconnectedness, Bridging the Past, Present and Future of Libraries, which is shortly going to be delivered by Dr. Heather Brown, Assistant Director, Arts Lab Australia. The Memorial Lecture is being organized to mark the first death anniversary of Dr. H.K. Call the founder director Delnet, the great visionary and a true Karm Yogi with outstanding contributions of 54 years to the LIS profession. He has significantly contributed in conceptualizing the networking of libraries in India and established Delnet way back in 1992 as a city-based library network with the name Delnet Delhi Library Network. His vision and mission to network the libraries and to serve the users community with timely network information resources has made Delnet a self-reliant library network, which is now the single largest library network in entire South Asia, connecting more than 7,000 libraries in India and outside. Empowering libraries, empowering professionals and users with knowledge for transformation was core to Dr. Call's ideology and leadership. It was on the same very day last year, that is on July 1st, 2020, Dr. H.K. Call left for his next journey after journeying through the libraries and literature for more than five decades, leaving behind an imperishable legacy of his fragrant, outstanding work, which will remain forever the testimony to his profound contributions in the field of library and information science and in establishing Delnet. All of us have come together today to pay our humble tributes and respects to him through the first Dr. H.K. Call Memorial Lecture instituted by Delnet in the everlasting memory of our Reverend Dr. H.K. Call. I would now like to take pleasure in introducing the distinguished chair of the session, Shri K. Jayakumarji, the president of Delnet, and also our special invited well-known speaker and the library expert, Dr. Heather Brown from Australia. Shri J K. Jayakumarji is the president of Delnet. He has a profound contributions of serving Indian administrative service for nearly four decades. He served as a Chief Secretary to Government of Kerala and as Joint Secretary, Ministry of Culture, Government of India. Shri K. Jayakumarji also served as a founding Vice Chancellor of the Malayalam University and currently serves as the Director of Institute in Management in Government, Thiruvananthapura. He is also a very well known poet, lyricist, translator, author, and a painter. Shri K. Jayakumarji has received various awards and recognitions for his outstanding contributions in the field of poetry, public service. He writes in Malayalam and English, published 32 books, including eight anthologies of poems. It's a profound privilege to have you, sir, today, and I must thank you for agreeing to chair the very first Dr. H. K. Call Memorial Lecture. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I have an immense pleasure and in Introducing you all to Dr. Heather Brown, a great friend of Telnet for years altogether. Dr. Heather Brown is an assistant director at Arts Lab Australia, one of Australia's leading conservation organization. Heather has, ad, has additional part-time roles as a librarian at the State Library of South Australia and at the University of South Australia, where she lectures to library and archive students. 
Dr. Heather and her husband, Kelvin, have been regular visitors to India since 1990s. Heather has a long-standing interest in traditional Indian cultural heritage and Indian libraries, and she has delivered lectures and presentations at numerous library conferences, seminars, and professional events, including at Delnet and also at NACLINS. Dr. Heather greatly admires the extraordinary vision, leadership, and practical work of Dr. H.K. Call, and is a great supporter and well-wisher of the work of Telnet and for each one of us at Telnet. Dr. Heather's interest lies in the field of physical and digital preservation management, and this links to the theme of this first Dr. H.K. Call Memorial Lecture on interconnectedness, bridging the past and present for the future of libraries. It's a profound honor for us to have Dr. Heather Brown with us today to deliver the very first Dr. H.K. Call Memorial Lecture. We welcome you, Heather, and would like to convey our very warm, sincere thanks and gratitude to you for agreeing, and it's a great honor for us to have you with us today. I would now like to request the chair, Shri K. Jayakumarji, President Telnet, to kindly start the deliberations. Kindly, sir. Thank you, Sangeeta, for the uh, introduction and welcome. It's an honor for all of us to be to be part of this today's meeting when uh, we are going to listen to the first Dr. H.K. Call Memorial Lecture. And I once again thank Dr. Heather Brown who are very graciously agreeing to be the first speaker uh, uh, after Dr. Call's demise last year this day. I know that you have been always a friend of Delnet and Dr. Call. And uh, after Dr. Call's demise, we would like you or we would rather request you to continue your valuable association with Delnet in the days to come, the very defining days to come, when the when Delnet as a movement is beginning to realize its importance in the new world today. So we will require the guidance and patronage of people like you who always had stood by Delnet when Dr. Cole was there and when Dr. Cole is not with us anymore. So that is my first request I would like to make you. Uh, to, to believe that uh, Dr. Cowell has left us one year ago is even today something which has not, which we have not been able to reconcile. This is not, uh, what I'm saying, this is not by way of the usual thing to be said during a first memorial lecture. No, this comes from uh, uh, the very heart very deep because Dr. Cole was a very inspiring presence, inspiring presence, benevolent all the time, compassionate all the time, unruffled. There was a very kind of a, a depth and uh, calmness about his demeanor. I always used to admire that. Uh, and I think that is, that is, it is that personality, uh, that author and inner personality, which actually helped him tied over all the practical difficulties in spearheading or ca campaigning for uh, a movement like Delnet, which was relatively unknown in the days when he started with it. Today, when we are, when the whole world is sort of fumbling with what to do with education, how to go ahead with education, what to do with uh, knowledge uh, resources, and uh, people are trying to find out how well we can use digital uh, knowledge and all these things, and uh, when quite a large part of the world, including governments, are floundering or fumbling about how to go about in this COVID uh, uh, restricted world. I think what Dr. Cowell has done a few decades ago is quite prophetic, I should say, as if he had visualized a time when digital resources are going to be of far more uh, critical value. And uh, that is where, you know, all great ideas have a, a time which we really do, do not know when that time comes and how. Here, the time of these digital resources and its stupendous uh, implication has come to us in the form of this pandemic, which is at a, very, at a very phenomenal cost of human life and suffering, yet the world is not going to be the same as it was. I think uh, like uh, we always talk about World War I and World War II, 
I think the post-World War II is quite different from the pre-World War, isn't it? Likewise, pre-COVID days are going to be entirely different from the post-COVID days or vice versa. Post-COVID days are not going to be like the pre-COVID days. This pandemic had been a very defining event in human history, and we in Delnet find ourselves in a very, very pivotal job, pivotal point. And I think, however traumatic and sad, human history and destiny also has a sense of timing. Dr. Cowell's demise also marks the end of one world, pre-COVID world, and the emergence of the new world, where the role of Delnet and digital technology and digital uh, uh, knowledge, architecture, everything undergoes a sea change. So it is in that very moment that death has decided to take him away from us. There is a historical uh, message uh, in the act of his exit. So however much we wish that if only he had been with us, but I think the destiny or the, the, there is a sense of justice in history where he thought, where, where, where destiny thinks that, okay, now Dr. Carl has done his job is for you or to take it forward. In this context, I would like to thank everybody, the, the, the Delnet family, headed by Dr. Sangeeta eminently, to have steered Delnet in these days of uh, upheaval, if I may say so. Uh, or uh, So they have managed it very well, I should say, because I don't go and sit there every day. I'm not uh, on their day-to-day -day administration, but uh, Delnet has managed very well, exceedingly well, in ensuring continuity with adaptation. It is not continuity as it existed. It continues, but it gets adapted. That is the hallmark of liveliness or life itself. So Delnet is a very lively organization because of this adaptability as well as continuity. So I should thank once again uh, the entire Delnet family and Sangeeta in particular. It have ensured the core values to continue as it is, but at the same time continuously adapting to the new changing environment, technological and knowledge environment. Therefore, Delta today finds itself in a very, very pivotal position where we are actually in a position of strength, unlike many institutions, where on the digital platform, I think Delta has considerable inner core strength, which I'm sure uh, the country, the nation, the people will definitely utilize our capability in uh, far more quantitative terms than it used to. We have recently launched the digital portal for the, the school portal, which I'm going to be a, quite a successful launching and the timing could not be, could not have been more appropriate because schools particularly the last two years have been quite devastating because children are not able to go to school. And at the, at the rural areas, the digital divide is making people, uh, it's creating havoc actually. The haves and the digital haves and the digital have nots among students is staring us as a stark reality. Because India, as you know, Dr. Heather, is a very heterogeneous country. Heterogeneous in every way. Economically heterogeneous, socially heterogeneous, politically heterogeneous. Or it, heterogeneity is in our DNA. Therefore, in a country like India, the digital divide, as they call, or uh, the digital equity is still not achieved. But at the same time, with great resilience, including rural schools, are switching on to mobile telephony to access classrooms access teachers. So I think a silent revolution is sweeping the country, even as we struggle with COVID and COVID-related agony that is on the one side. At the same time, the agonizing times of this pandemic has brought out the inner resilience of particularly Indians in this country, where they are grappling with new possibilities and potential. It is in this context that we are meeting today to for the first uh, HK call, Dr. HK call Memorial Lecture. And we have got the right person with the right topic. Uh, as we call is no stranger to Dr. Peter Brown. We, she knows him as much as we know him. And the topic interconnectedness, bridging the past, present, and future libraries would not have been a more appropriate topic for the times. So I welcome Dr. Peter Brown once again to this very important, uh, very important function as far as we are concerned. We are also reconcile, trying to reconcile to the fact that Dr. Paul is no more. Uh, every memorial lecture, you know, that brings back that reality. So 
even as his loss is is well felt even today history has to go on human life has to go on so we have to go on adapting to the uh, to the present and the future with the inherited values of the past so dr call will be with us all the time as a guiding force and with these few words i welcome dr heather brown once again and welcome all the participants and office bearers of telnet and participants to this webinar who had been kind enough to give us patronage year after year i wish you all the best and i shall not steal uh, the valuable time of dr dr heather brown on to her uh, for the memorial lecture thank you thank you dr heather brown and dr sigita carry on with this Heather, uh, we would like to uh, request you. Uh, it's a pleasure now in requesting you to kindly deliver the very first Dr. H.K. Call Memorial Lecture. It's over to you, Heather. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sri Jayakumarji, President of Dolnet, distinguished colleagues, wonderful colleagues all around India. It's such a great honour to deliver this lecture as we honour the memory of Dr. H. K. Call and his extraordinary vision and his great legacy. The beginning point of my lecture is interconnectedness and it links us all together now as we honour Dr. Call's memory and the gifts that he has given to us all. It is because of Dr. Call that we are connected across different parts of India and across oceans and different lands and in different time zones because of this great man. So this lecture is in three parts. First of all, an introduction on Dr. Call and Delnet to set the scene. And then the second part is on preservation, which is a bridge from the past to the present and the future of libraries. And then finally and briefly, a reflection on Dr. Call and the future. So firstly, interconnectedness. Dr. Call profoundly understood the interconnectedness and the interconnected nature of all things. And he especially brought this way of seeing into his poetry and it penetrated deeply into his work in the field of librarianship and his understanding of interconnectedness was underpinned by his knowledge and his practice of yoga which in essence as we all know means union and fittingly, Dr. Call began his career in 1964 as a yoga research assistant at Lakshmi Bar National University of Physical Education at Gwalior. So, connections with Dr. Call. Where and when did your own connections with Dr. H.K. Call begin? Can you remember when you first met him? Each of us has our own story. My connections with Dr. Call began in 2006 on the 1st of August, and fittingly, it took place at a great library, the National Library of India in Kolkata. And fittingly, Sri Jayakumarji also attended this function. It was an event to celebrate International Friendship Day and it was jointly organised by the Academy of Bengali Poetry and the National Library of India. And it involved presentations by a number of invited Indian poets, along with my husband, Kelvin Brown, an Australian poet. And it was here that we first met Dr. H.K. Call, who was one of the chief guests in his interconnected role as a poet and a board member of the National Library of India. And that meeting, it ignited a spark that connected Kelvin and myself with Dr. Call and his visionary work in librarianship and in poetry. And our conversation was about poetry, libraries, knowledge and preservation for future generations. It was a wonderful moment. Chumbak, 
a magnet of interconnectedness. And three, Jayakumaji, that chumbak, that connectedness to respond to your first request. That will always be there, that connection with Delnet. And so it came to pass in that following year in 2007, I attended my first knuckling conference at the India International Centre in Delhi. And so began a close professional involvement with Delnet, Dr. H.K. Call and Dr. Sangeeta Call. And this in turn has led to a chain of connections with information professionals such as yourselves across India. Dr. Hari Krishnan Kaur was born in 1941 in Srinagar, which is known as one of the most beautiful places on the earth. And to introduce his journey, I'll quote just a few lines from a poem that my husband Kelvin wrote in memory of Dr. H.K. Kaur, and the poem is called A Belonging. He came from the snow-clad mountains belonging to a mystical land where mists covered the glass. His path walked the land of India, bringing together with strength and commitment, the words, the literature and the knowledge India beheld. So walking the land of India, Dr. Call gained his degree in librarianship from Rajasthan University, his master's from the University of Mumbai and his PhD from Pune University. He began at the India International Centre and served there as a chief librarian for over 40 years. And it was there with his way of seeing that Dr. Call developed the interconnected concept of Delnet, which was born in a library, that India International Centre Library in 1988. And the story of Delnet is well known and Sangeeta has already painted part of that history. It started as a city-based library popularly known as the Delhi Library Network connecting the libraries of Delhi, became registered as a society in 92 and then on the 13th of September 2000, the Delhi Library Network expanded to become Delnet, the developing library network. While preparing for this lecture, I watched again the Silver Jubilee documentary video and I listened to the words of Dr. H.K. Call. And as he speaks, a number of his extraordinary leadership qualities shine through. I'll share a few with you and I know that you will have many more to add. Firstly, his high purpose. And to quote from the words that he says during the documentary, my main concern has been for the good of the country, for the good of India. Secondly, his strategic vision and inspiring leadership. I have thought of big projects, says Dr. Call, networking libraries in spreading and disseminating knowledge to those who need it. As another example of this tray, Sangeeta Call informed me that Dr. H.K. Call was the one who submitted a feasibility study for the Indian Digital Library Initiative way back in 2001. Indeed, a beginning for a, a, a very important project. Wisdom and skills. And again, Dr. Call's words describe his balanced approach, his calmness um, to approaching the hurdles and the challenges that face all of us. The hurdles that come across are not hurdles to stop you. The people who created the hurdles don't understand what they're doing. I now feel that they benefited me in taking a rigorous and better course. And Dr. Call's unswerving commitment. For me, 
it is a mission. And when you are in a mission mode, for example, digging a tunnel in a hill, you don't come back until you reach the other end. Either you are finished or you go ahead. There is no other way. So, turning to Delnet. Dr. Call's vision of the interconnectedness of libraries is manifest today in the practical reality of Delnet, a vibrant, interconnected network with over 7,000 members across 22 countries. No library is an island, and together, libraries can connect and share their resources and their knowledge. And together, Dillnet members are building a professional community of practice that interconnects information professionals and their users with knowledge across all subjects. So that truly in the words of the earlier poem, Dillnet has become a bringing together of the words, the literature, and the knowledge that India beholds. Dillnet's resources are now ever expanding interconnections. Union catalogues of books and periodicals, databases, theses, and dissertations. Dillnet provides access to full e-journals in knowledge areas ranging from agriculture to medical science, to library and information management, to mass media, and a consortium of e-journal packages. Dillnet provides interlibrary loans and document deliveries across and beyond India. It provides reference services and links to expert knowledge. And importantly, Dillnet provides ongoing skilling and quality training of information professionals through practical training programs, workshops and lectures. And many of us have also experienced the rich cross fertilization of ideas and library trends that have occurred at the Dillnet NACLIN conferences. So Dillnet goes ahead, interconnecting and networking libraries and spreading knowledge. So let us turn to knowledge. The greatest tool is knowledge. This was a message of the Honourable APJ Abdul Kalam, former President of India, as he inaugurated the NACLIN conference at Pondicherry, which I attended in December 2014. And you can view the excerpts on the Delnet Silver Jubilee documentary video. I also recall the words of another wise man, the late Sadish Bok Maharaj from Pune, who also said of knowledge, money does not last, empires disappear, nothing else but knowledge lasts eternally. And Dr. Call had a clear vision of the pivotal role that library and information professionals can play in disseminating knowledge. And Dr. Call's vision focuses on the creation of knowledge centres, focal points of knowledge that can connect with one another across India and internationally. In the chapter on knowledge centres in his book, Empowering Libraries, Strategies for the Future, Dr. Call sets the scene in chapter eight with a famous quotation from Eliot's Choruses from the Rock. Where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? And where is the knowledge we have lost in information? And as Dr. Call explains in the video, our society is experiencing information overload. As societies internationally, across those societies, people are using popular search engines to find useful knowledge. And yet instead, they come up with millions of hits from an array of poor quality information sources. So this is where libraries can take on that role of knowledge centres, providing access to high quality curated knowledge. Dr. Call speaks of the role of library and information professionals as knowledge workers in judiciously evaluating, selecting, and curating high quality information resources that are at the core of these knowledge centres. Dr. Call sees this curatorial role as being interconnected. In the video, 
He describes how library and information professionals should connect and network with experts who can advise on selecting and curating and accessing high quality information resources for these knowledge centres. As Dr. Call discusses in his chapter on knowledge centres, there's a great more to the depth and breadth of the knowledge worker role. It involves organising and describing and linking the information resources and making the contents available via the latest technologies and scientific advances. And the knowledge involves interconnect, interconnecting information across all formats, digital and physical. It involves winnowing and filtering out poor quality or superficial knowledge. And that's what Dr. Call calls bridging, which is interconnecting with experts to arrange for authoritative advice to be provided to users. And these are interconnections on so many levels. And now to part two of the lecture, the role of preservation. It is the bridge that links the knowledge of the past with the present and transports it into the future. Now here, Dr. Call had a deep understanding of the pivotal role that knowledge centres can play in preserving the incredible richness of India's knowledge, its ancient and its traditional knowledge, as well as its modern, scientific and technological innovations. Remember those early words about wisdom and money does not last and empires uh, disappear and rulers come and go. It's the knowledge that takes us into the future. And this significant knowledge can be found in India's ancient manuscripts. And this international heritage is recorded on the UNESCO's Memory of the World Register. And as the National Mission for Manuscripts notes, these are held in a range of India's libraries, as well as other repositories, such as manuscript resource centres and archives and private and religious organisations. This significant knowledge can also be found in other unique digital and physical resources that are held across India's national special government, academic, scientific, society, and other types of libraries. So many treasures. Reflect for a moment, what is significant and unique in your library that needs to be preserved for the future? What is at risk? These items are indeed preservation priorities. And to illustrate just on the left uh, are some of the very precious and unique items from the Library of the National Institute of Fashion Technology. And on the right, um, some uh, very rare books from the Indira Gandhi National Centre for the Arts Library, just to illustrate that point. And the priorities for preservation should include physical and digital formats. So here's some examples from the Sri Aurobindo archives at Pondicherry. The physical um, archives and works of uh, Sri Aurobindo and the digital and uh, digitised versions and the catalogues and the indexes and the finding aids, both are significant. And you would all be knowing from the Indira Gandhi National Centre for the Arts, the digital library, the resources of Indian cultural heritage, another world class international heritage resource that is part of the, the, the memory and the treasure of, for the whole world, not just India. Extraordinary. So Dr. Call understood profoundly that the preservation of knowledge will benefit future generations in India and internationally, because it connects the richness of the past with the present and the future. And he knew that preservation and access are two connected sides of the same coin. We can't provide access unless we preserve or safeguard the knowledge 
but there's no point in preserving that knowledge and locking it away. It's useless without access. So Dr. Call was vitally interested in the strategic role of preservation in knowledge management. And he also encouraged my PhD research in the field of physical and digital preservation management because he understood the importance of that and its implications for Indian libraries and its vast collection of significant and unique knowledge in all formats. And indeed, my research uncovered that best practice preservation management is interconnected it's like an ecosystem or like the connections in those beautiful Indian garlands. So chopping preservation into little chunks and trying to manage preservation in separate compartments does not make sense and nor does it work effectively. And despite the widely held view that digital is different, there's a number of similarities between preserving knowledge in digital and physical forms. So I'll start with the principles, which are like high level norms or general ways of thinking, because the principles provide the foundation for preservation. And here's a summary of the principles that I uncovered in my research that are absolutely identical, that are similar between the physical domain and the digital domain. And I've put a ring around interconnectedness. And as you run your eyes through those, you'll see principles like minimum intervention, which is first do no harm, or um, choosing, selecting for preservation. That's common to both physical and to digital preservation. And then at the next level, from the principle level, is the level of strategies, the kind of how to do preservation. And strategies are really groups of actions to achieve the preservation objectives. And an example of a strategy in preservation is disaster management, which I'll focus on a little later. So my research uncovered that many of the physical and the digital preservation strategies are similar. And I've particularly highlighted that area of disaster management. However, I noted in the research that some of the very specialised and, and technical strategies in the two domains are different. For example, in digital preservation, there's technological strategies such as emulating and migrating and digital forensics. And similarly, in physical preservation, there's very technical and specialised strategies that my colleagues at the Indira Gandhi National Centre of the Arts Conservation section would talk about when they talk about the chemistry and the, and the physical uh, conservation of items. So they're specialised and they're different. But having said that, there's a number of strategies that are similar. So where to begin with preservation? And I'm just going to run through a couple of the strategies and the, uh, to um, give you a few hints and tips, some shortcuts for preserving into the future. So first of all, number one strategy is surveying. Surveying is like in traditional Ayurvedic medicine. It's like uh, taking the pulse. It's knowing the needs of what um, what are in the collections. So if they're physical collections, it's finding out what the priority collections have and what is their condition. Are they damaged? Like the uh, image of the uh, very damaged book, uh, which is on the right hand side. And that image is provided courtesy of a colleague at the Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts. So you're, during your survey, check out what the building's like. Are there leaks? Are there gaps and holes? Um, are the gutters clean? What kind of security arrangements are in place? What's the storage like? Are collections stored on the floor? What's the environment like? Um, and what's the temperature like? Is it, uh, is it hot? Is there good air moving through? Um, are there fluctuations in humidity? 
uh, what kind of handling practices are in place. So your survey is basically a risk assessment and that risk assessment I'll pick up a bit later when we come to the area of disaster management. So it's basically what a doctor would do if you're going to visit the doctor and the doctor kind of surveys you as a, as a human being to find out what the risks are in your area. So uh, check out the risks, that's the number one uh, priority. And that's for physical collections. And then for digital collections, you can do the same. What kind of obsolete formats do you have? Make a list. Number two, control the environment. And by that, I do not mean put in air conditioning. <laughs> in fact, having air conditioning switch on and off can cause a lot of fluctuations um, in uh, temperature and humidity. I have a saying that says keep the temperature as low as possible and keep the fluctuations as slow as possible. But the collections can be pretty stable um, even in high temperature or low temperature um, and if the fluctuations um, in humidity aren't rapidly going up and down. So my mother, for example, would um, her treasure was a piano and she simply moved that to an inside room in the house and not next to an outside wall. The house wasn't air conditioned. And in Adelaide, our temperatures go up to 46, sometimes 47 degrees. So um, that piano, uh, which is very precious to my mother, was kept in a very stable environment because she simply moved it to an inside room. And make sure the air is circulating. So here's an example um, on the top uh, from Bandaka Oriental Research Institute in Pune. And you can see the light coming through that window is actually wire mesh. And the air was circulating through because it was very humid. It was actually monsoon. And keeping that air circulating was reducing the risk of mould. And dust, that can be quite a danger in collections, and we'll see a few more examples later. But uh, controlling the dust um, is a simple way of controlling the environment. And those needs are similar in the digital environment where you may have service present. So there's international um, standards for uh, controlling the server environment, including temperature and humidity, and also uh, keeping the dust levels low. Storage uh, for the uh, physical collections, um, there are great um, and long standing traditions in India for wrapping uh, manuscripts in red cloth. And some of the research is now showing that the dye in the red cloth um, can be helpful in uh, repelling insects. Um, so that slide on the left was taken from Mumbai University Library. And on the right hand side, some specialised um, protective storage being uh, produced by the IGNCA conservation section. And digital storage, the same thing, start simply and arrange backups. And uh, the suggestion is to have backups in at least two separate locations. And if you have your digital storage in the cloud, do a bit of uh, due diligence and check where the cloud is because ultimately the cloud is going to be on a server somewhere. Is it in another country? How easy is it to get the data back out of the cloud? But sadly, um, a number of the digital disasters have happened where organisations have had backups, but the backups are actually in the same place. So no point. Integrated pest management. Um, India has long traditions in with uh, techniques such as the use of neem leaves for repelling insects and using an integrated pest management approach rather than the chemicals can um, avoid and block and detect um, insects and other kinds of creatures rather than um, hit them straight away uh, with chemicals. So India again has these rich uh, traditions and, and techniques that the rest of the world can learn from. Housekeeping. Hmm. 
On the left hand side, um, an example from an anonymous um, Indian manuscript collection. Uh, you can see those um, palm leaf manuscripts uh, covered in dust and uh, higgledy piggledy stored on a window ledge. Um, against a window and that is very high risk uh, because it is poor housekeeping. Um, and on the right hand side, um, an example of very good housekeeping which is happening in the Bandaka Oriental Research Institute. They're simply brushing out uh, dirt, they do an, um, little flakes of dirt, they do an annual spring clean um, of their precious manuscripts. So um, example of good and bad. So cleaning I have seen uh, being undertaken at uh, Mumbai University Library, at the Papal Seminary Library at Pune. It's simple, effective and keeps um, insects away and uh, uh, gets rid of um, a number of pests. Um, other kinds of pests and also the people doing the housekeeping and the cleaning are the eyes and ears of the collections. Security. What are the security arrangements for your significant collections, particularly those items that are on exhibition? Um, and who guards the guards? A wonderful saying because sometimes the enemy is within. And what about um, in the digital area? Um, cyber attacks and hacking, they're certainly on the rise and during COVID um, viruses and vulnerabilities have increased with working from home. For example, in my, my uh, workplaces, uh, we're at very strict controls on, um, on uh, taking USBs uh, home, they have to be virus checked um, and, uh, and encrypted so that uh, we're not creating security problems for our organisations. So both physical and digital collections need attention to security. Metadata, um, as uh, li library colleagues, um, you will know and love this term. Uh, and a good definition is that it's structured data about data, the who, what, where and when. So we're familiar with metadata with our catalogues and databases and descriptions of the physical formats of material and preservation metadata can also comment on the conditions, uh, physical conditions of items, whether they're in poor condition and, uh, and so forth. And in the digital arena, of course, um, similarly, uh, metadata uh, can describe uh, the technical aspects and descriptive information and also any changes that are made in digital preservation. So migrating something from uh, one format to another or one version to another. All of that's recorded as part of the metadata and if something's digitised, uh, the relationship to the original. So metadata is a tool for not only managing access, it's a tool for managing preservation. So number eight tip is one that I'm going to focus on uh, a little more and that is the area of disaster management and disaster management involves safeguarding significant knowledge collections from damage caused by disaster and that's a topic of critical importance to India because it's fundamental to enabling the survival of India's knowledge into the future and it builds community resilience after a disaster event. And really disaster management is the most important strategy because everything else that we do, we catalog, we have document delivery, we have knowledge centres, we have good buildings, we're trying to care for the collections um, and describe them with metadata, we can try and do everything but all of that just simply breaks apart when disaster strikes. And India has many um, and still continues to have uh, many disasters. Um, and just last year, a number of you will recall the disaster in Jaipur at Albert Hall Museum. And here's some of the uh, books um, that had been uh, damaged by uh, flood and water damage being um, laid out for recovery. 
And a couple of years ago in Delhi, um, 2016, um, a number of you will recall the fire in the Museum of Natural History, which had a devastating effects for the collection. And even if it's fire, there's uh, usually still water damage to the collections. So another shortcut or a key resource, a free resource for disaster management um, is a gift from Australia. It's from our own um, Australian Library and Information Association called ALIA and uh, their disaster management res uh, resources are co-written by myself and another colleague. So you can download them freely. And on the left, um, the, the uh, document uh, with a little brown triangle is really a guide and it provides an overview to disaster management. And the one um, on the right hand side with the little triangle in green is a template for uh, building your own disaster plan. So they're free resources um, and available um, from Australia for, for you to um, access and to use to help build your own uh, disaster resilience. And just going through uh, disaster management and the essential uh, parts of it, um, the stages are the same in digital and physical disaster response. And there's four essential stages. So the most important stages actually happen before a disaster and they're prevention and preparation. And that's where the main focus needs to be because good prevention and preparation is going to mitigate the risks or the effects of a disaster. And then during a disaster, that stage is your response. And then after the disaster is the recovery, which is really uh, putting everything uh, back in place. So I'm just going to go through those stages. And I'm going to illustrate them with reference to a workshop which was held in 2019. It was a joint workshop between Art Lab Australia, which is uh, where I work, and the Indira Gandhi National Centre for the Arts. And it was uh, during that workshop uh, that I also spent time um, in Delnet and had a conversation with Dr. Call and Dr. Sangeeta Call about disaster management. So let's start with before and that's prevention and our old friend, the surveys and the risk assessments. Really good way of checking out what the risks are and those risks will help determine your disaster plan. What are the places where you can see stains on the ceiling, which are going to be where the leaks happen um, in, in your organisation? Um, what kind of building maintenance um, happens and, and who's responsible for that? And in the IT or digital area, what are the digital security risks? Where are the backups um, happening? Who has access? Who has authorization? So that's really kind of checking out the risks. Um, also the geographical locations as well, because um, I am aware, um, particularly in other Asian countries of uh, libraries that are built, are built uh, beautifully on the banks of the river. And in Australia, uh, the State Library of Queensland um, in Brisbane is built right on the banks of the Brisbane River. Um, and they experienced a major threat with the flooding of the Brisbane River. So often architects and, and designers and so forth will pick this beautiful picturesque um, position for a library collection and then uh, don't think about the risks of flooding. And if collections particularly are stored in the basement, um, there's, there's going to be big risks uh, when um, the inevitable happens um, and there are floods. So prevention, is the surveys and the risk assessments. The next stage is preparing. And part of that is putting together a disaster plan, which is based on the risks. Um, and as I said, that uh, template from um, ALIA, the Australian Library and Information Association, has a disaster plan that you can adapt to your own organisation. And in that plan, you should be forming a disaster team. 
people who can respond uh, to a disaster to help reduce the damage. And I've got a, a superman uh, on the left who's uh, going to be in charge of the D, the digital collections, and uh, uh, a, a wonder woman on the right who's going to be in charge of the physical collections, or you could reverse those roles. But at the moment, you probably need that specialist knowledge from the two areas to have a disaster uh, plan that's integrated, that, that covers those two domains. Part of the preparation has to involve training, and that's giving uh, people experience in how to respond to a disaster, because you can't just have a plan that's theoretical. So that is why uh, that workshop was undertaken at the Indira Gandhi National Centre for the Arts. So it was uh, with Dr. Achal Pandya and his colleagues. And the people who attended that workshop came from uh, a few libraries, but also the National Archives, which is just across, um, across the road. Uh, we had people from Red Cross, a number of people from museums and a number of conservation students. Um, so a wide range of people attending that um, very, very much a sort of hands-on workshop of how to respond to disasters um, to reduce the risk of damage. So training is an essential part of the preparation. And then there's a response. So uh, this is a simulated disaster that we had in that uh, workshop. Uh, Dr. Achal Pandya found a trough and we filled it with water and soaked um, a number of uh, uh, books and uh, documents that could be disposed of to simulate a disaster. We soaked them the night before. And as you can see from that slide, uh, they're getting stained, the dye starting to come out of the um, textiles and some of the books. Uh, they're warping, they're becoming sodden and uh, 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 blowing up, they're e expanding as well and, and they're going to become very fragile and difficult to handle. So that's going to give us a real life experience of what it's like to handle uh, uh, physical collections that have been damaged um, uh, due to water and over 90% of disasters involve water. And here we are, um, Anne Denis, my colleague from Art Lab, is demonstrating how to um, recover materials safely that are water damaged and how to basically dry them out. So we had a lot of fans uh, going there. And another technique we explained was also freezing items uh, that are water damaged, placing them in um, plastic, sealing them and placing them, packing them neatly and placing them in a freezer so we can respond to that later. And that was a, a technique newly introduced to India and uh, we're hoping that that will be spread around India to help um, buy time to respond to damaged items. And then the last stage, um, after you've uh, salvaged priority materials, and again, that goes back to selecting what's a priority in your organisation for preservation, what's unique. Um, it's for salvaging materials, it's going to be your priorities, not your fiction collection probably, but your rare books, or in the case of the um, uh, National Institute for Fashion Technology, it's, it's probably going to be their textiles. Um, for other uh, libraries, it could be their digital collections. So salvaging uh, the priority collections for the future. And then afterwards is recovery. That's uh, getting uh, everything uh, back and, and running again. And that's uh, the participants uh, from the workshop who are recovering. And in there, you might see some familiar faces. So right in the middle is Dr. Uh, Ramesh Gower, for example, from the IGNCA library. But a number of, of colleagues uh, from libraries, um, archives, uh, conservation students, um, from um, largely from around Delhi. So that's the, the last stage of uh, recovery. So, um, I wanted to say that um, one of my last conversations with Dr. Call was about the possibility of Dillnet taking up the role of training and disaster management in, a, in an approach that interconnects disaster management for physical and digital collections. And in the future, this training role could involve Dillnet 
in partnering with other like-minded organisations to deliver disaster management training to build up India's capabilities in disaster management of its unique knowledge resources, those extraordinary resources. And indeed, the Interconnected Disaster Management became a session at last year's NACLIN conference held in September, and I jointly delivered um, a, a session with Dr. Achal Pandya from IGNCA. So stay tuned for future developments. So now, briefly, part three, I'd like to end by addressing Dr. H.K. Korn, and I'd like to address this as if Dr. Call was standing here with us, um, as he is with us in spirit. So Dr. Call, today at your memorial lecture, we celebrate your life and your great works. We are inspired by your extraordinary qualities, focusing on a higher purpose for the benefit of India your strategic vision and your inspiring leadership, your wisdom and skills and unswerving commitment. All this was made possible through your way of seeing and profound understanding of interconnectedness. This interconnectedness is manifest today in the practical reality of Dillnet. Dillnet embodies your vision of the interconnected curatorial role of knowledge centres and boundary crossing information professionals who provide expert knowledge and training and support to the wider library community. And furthermore, your deep understanding of interconnectedness underpins the recognition of the key role that preservation plays in managing knowledge from the past, for the present and for the future. And the legacy of your great work will continue connecting across time and space. It will enable India's extraordinary rich knowledge of the past to be linked with the present and to be transported into the future. You are an extraordinary leader, a role model and an inspiration to us all. We will honour you by continuing your vision for ultimately in your own words, we will go ahead. There is no other way. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Heather, for delivering a highly enlightening, engaging and an insightful talk. Thank you so much for sharing your vast expertise on preservation, on disaster management, and most importantly, about Dr. H.K. Call, in whose memory we have instituted this memorial lecture. We are indeed, indeed, much grateful to you, Dr. Heather, for all your time and efforts in delivering this talk, and we are going to remember and cherish it forever. Thank you so very much indeed. I, on behalf of Delnet, would like to request the chair and the president of Delnet Shri K. Jayakumarji to kindly present a plaque of honor to our distinguished speaker, Dr. Heather Brown. I would like to request you, sir, on behalf of Delnet, to kindly present a yeah. plaque of honor to Dr. Heather Brown <laughs> for yeah. delivering first Dr. H.K. Call Memorial Lecture. Peter, this will be delivered to you and uh, exactly. we are happy Thank that... Thank you. I've caught it. <laughs> <laughs> that was wonderful. It was a wonderful lecture, comprehensive and to the point. And I'm sure you must have worked hard to sort of condense all these ideas into the time frame. And we are exactly one hour into the program. That uh, speaks a lot. So thank you very much for enriching this memorial program by your very insightful and relevant lecture. We shall continue to receive your association and patronage as I said. Thank you. Thank you. Chumbak. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Ether, and we are going to send it across to you, and it, it's going to reach you yet another one week time.
Uh, with the permission of the chair and the distinguished speaker, I would like to uh, find out whether can we take a few questions from our attendees, if time permits, Dr. Heather. Is it possible? Can we take yes, a few yes. questions from our attendees? OK, yes. so with the permission of the chair and a distinguished speaker, I would like to request our attendees if they want to ask any questions uh, about uh, uh, the digital preservation or about the disaster management to our speaker. Please kindly raise your digital hand and we'll be very happy to get you connected uh, with our speaker. Please kindly raise your digital hand and uh, so that we can give you an audio control and you can ask the question. We have uh, Mr. Basana Das who may like to ask a question. Mr. Basana Das, please kindly introduce yourself and uh, ask the question and try to be as brief as you can. Mr. Basana Das, please unmute yourself and ask the question. He's from Kolkata. <laughs> from Kolkata, yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We have Chitra B. Uh, Chitra, uh, Mrs. Chitra B. Chitra, please unmute yourself. Chitra B. Uh, Chitra, could you please unmute yourself to ask the question? Okay, let me just see the chat box. Uh, uh, and there are mm -hmm. a couple of questions being posted there. And one of the question that uh, is, it's from uh, this is from uh, Professor Subrata Chakravarti, the former director of Indian Institute of Management, uh, Lucknow. And uh, Hita, this is for you. And he is wanting to know today management professionals, both in academia and in industry, are at a loss to figure out what knowledge they need at this juncture. Would you have any suggestions to offer? But this um, is... <laughs> that's a very broad topic. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, for management, I think uh, to to begin to ask what management uh, knowledge you need, I'd ask the why question, which is what Dr. Call would ask at the beginning. So why is it important? Uh, what is its significance? And uh, what benefit, as Dr. Call would ask, what benefit will it be to my users? Um, and is it um, expert knowledge as well. And for management, how do you translate the knowledge into practical usefulness? Um, so there's academic knowledge and having uh, recently completed my PhD, I know a lot of that is um, knowledge in, it's intellectual knowledge and it's rigorous, but it's not, <laughs> Um, able to be practiced uh, by a number of people. So I also look for the why, which is the philosophy, and I also look for the practical philosophy, which is the application of the of the knowledge. So that's a very broad response, but I think asking why and and seeing the the benefits and then being able to put it into practice are very good guidelines. And those guidelines, um, I can see that Dr. Call himself has followed too. He's thought about the why, he's thought about the priorities, he's thought about connecting and then the practical benefits to libraries and ultimately the people right across India. Thank you very much, Dr. Heather. There is yet another question coming from Mr. Uh, H.R. Mohan, uh, who has been a former vice president at Hindu Chennai uh, of systems he has Chennai. been taking care yeah. of. Yes, from Chennai. And the question to you is, Dr. Heather, could you please highlight the role of indexing in preserving the organizational knowledge? Mm. Who mm. decides what to be preserved and archived? Yeah, so uh, the indexing is part of the metadata so it is uh, making knowledge discoverable and also without uh, having that uh, metadata you can't actually preserve it into the future because uh, you can't uh, 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 record what needs to be um, digitally um, migrated or emulated and so forth. So I think it's about what criteria would you use for uh, describing or um, for 
um, indexing. And I'd say it's the selection criteria for significant material that's important. So my PhD supervisor in Australia is uh, Dr. Ross Harvey, and he had a number of simple criteria for deciding what is significant to preserve. And he said, first of all, for a physical collection, it's the condition. Um, and also the rarity and the uniqueness. And I, I had a couple of examples there from NIFT, the National Institute of Fashion Technology, those unique uh, textiles, uh, the Aurobindo archives, just about all of that is unique material. But even in um, uh, smaller libraries, I have seen manuscripts there that are absolutely unique, even in, um, in tiny uh, little libraries. I've seen little gems of, of uh, manuscripts or theses uh, that are quite unique. Or in the larger libraries, like university libraries, there it's research data and the theses and original knowledge that's been uh, put together by the researchers and the academics. So that's unique. That's not available anywhere else in the world. So that's got to be your priorities to preserve. And if you look at some of those digital uh, collections and repositories that are now starting to evolve across India, audiovisual materials of Indian music, um, videos of uh, Indian dance and drama, and uh, collections of the Indian stories, the ancient stories, the folk tales, all of that is absolutely unique. But at the same time, there's Indian scientists who are uh, creating and developing and, and um, new materials. Uh, for example, it was an Indian uh, person who, who developed the USB, you know, those pen drives. So all the data and the, and the research that's relating to that and the publications are unique. That's Indian material. It's not available anywhere else in the world. So that's what India should concentrate on, to focus on, to preserve. So it, it's it's India's gift to the whole world. And I have to say those ancient manuscripts, India has the largest, oh, arguably, uh, the largest collection of manuscripts in the world that cover all topics from shipbuilding to how to look after elephants, you know, to Ayurvedic medicines, which some of the big drug companies around the world are seeking desperately, to music, all of those sorts of things, all of those topics, um, economics, architecture, they're also covered in the manuscripts, such rich treasures across India. So I think there's, there's a huge task to describe and document what's there. And then that also enables the preservation. Thank you very much, Dr. Heather. Now I would like to request uh, Shri K. Jai Kumar Ji to kindly give the closing presidential remarks. May I request you, sir? I would like to request uh, yeah. Jai Kumar, sir. Yes, sir. Please, kindly, sir. I didn't get you. What am I supposed to do? Are we oh, closing? Sir, the, the, the closing, sir. Yeah, the presidential remarks, sir. And towards the closing. Okay, okay. I think I have remarked enough. And I thank the... Uh, <laughs> And it was a wonderful uh, program, and we have a very large number of uh, professionals attending this meeting. Nearly 500 people have attended this when you were speaking, which is a very, uh, by online standards, it is very good. <laughs> 500 people for a conference is very good indeed, and it speaks volumes for Dr. Cole as well as for yes. you. Yes. It is, uh, we hold you in high esteem, and that is that explains. A large number of attendees for this meeting. Thank you very much for the kind words, and uh, we look forward to seeing you not only virtually but really as the days improve. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hugh. So, yeah, on thank behalf you. of Delnet, we would like to uh, thank once again our uh, speaker, Dr. Thank Heather you. Brown, for delivering the very first Dr. HK Call Memorial Lecture. Thank you, Heather. We will never be able to thank you enough for being so supportive over the years, stupendous support that, and always, always being there around for us whenever we require your help. Thank you so much.
truly we feel no, blessed enough you know, to have you. And we are much grateful to the chair, Shri K. Jayakumar, sir, for chairing the session and always being of great uh, support and advice. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. We are much grateful to each one of you for being there uh, with us today wherein we have celebrated uh, the life uh, of Dr. H. K. Call, the wonderful work uh, that he has left behind, and he has greater responsibilities on us to ensure that we are able to carry forward his mission of networking libraries and to spread the light through the medium of uh, providing information and knowledge to them. Thank you so much. It was a great honor for Delhi to have we each should one also, of We should also thank the large number of uh, attendees who participated oh, in this yes, meeting yes. and uh, encouraged us by Yes. Thank you very much. Can, for, I, uh, can, I add, yeah. uh, can I add one more thing? In Dr. Cole's memory, we have planted a garden in a little garden oh. in a house, and we, oh, very, we have a lamp. Nice. And mm -hmm. so there is a memorial for Dr. Cole in Australia as well. Oh, very good. <laughs> and, very good. Thank yes, you. Very good. We are touched. We are much touched. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, one and all, once again. And it was indeed a great honor for us, you know, to have each one of you with us today. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank Namaskar. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thank you very much.